Question 31. As an economic analyst at a large financial firm, Grace is tasked with assessing the potential impact of recent changes in housing permits and construction data on future economic trends. Given the leading nature of these indicators, what conclusions might Grace most likely draw about the forthcoming economic conditions? So since these are leading indicators, uh, the housing permits and construction data, what we're kind of going to be looking for in these questions is, um, to simplify it, good housing permits or good construction data um, leads to good future economic trends. Or uh, conversely, bad permits data and bad construction data means bad economic trends. So we really just looking for the answer where that um, the data and the economic in the future lines up. So stagnant construction data, um, that's going to be bad because builders would normally, um, that's going to be bad data. And that's suggesting a rapid economic turnaround is imminent. That's going to be good. So we can automatically cross off A. Um, those two things don't line up. If we're expecting a economic turnaround, construction data should be um, should look good and wouldn't be stagnant. There should be more activity picking up, and that would kind of lead to a better turnaround in the future. B, the economy is likely to enter an expansion phase if housing permits and construction activities are increasing. So enter an expansion phase, that's good. And housing permits and construction activities increasing, that's also good. Uh, so it sounds like B will be our answer, but let's just look at C, make sure we can rule that out. A decrease in housing permits, bad, indicates immediate improvements in consumer confidence and economic stability. Um, so we've got a bad here and then something that's going to be good in the future. So we can cross that one off, that doesn't align either, so we're going to go with answer B. Question 32. Smith Hermes is a portfolio manager that invests in small cap stocks that are subject to mergers and acquisitions. That asset allocation and return data of Smith's portfolio are provided in the following table. Using the given data, the deviation of the weighted average mean return from the arithmetic mean return of the portfolio will be closest to. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to find these two different means. So we're going to find the arithmetic mean, which is just going to be these asset returns. And we're going to just divide by five. So I'll pull that in here first so you can kind of see that. So we're just adding up these numbers, the 0 0.21, 0 0.175 for 17.5, and so on. And divide by five, we get 0 0.091 or 9.1%. Uh, then next, we're going to be doing the weighted average mean. So we pull that in here. And for that, we're going to be calculating the mean based on the asset allocation. So we're going to do 0.13 times 0.21 as our first variable. And then we're going to do 0.24 times our 0.175 and we're just going to go down the line and do that. So we've got our minus 11 times 0.27. Um, and so this is weighting the returns based on the asset allocation of the portfolio. So we can see here we get 0.0756 um, or 7.56%. So all we have to do now is subtract these two numbers. So we have 7.56% minus 9.1%. We get minus 1.54. And that gives us answer A, the weighted average mean deviates by minus 1.54. Question 33. If in 2001, dollar euro equals 3.67, and in 2002, dollar euro equals 4.67, we would most likely say that the euro has depreciated, the dollar has depreciated, or the dollar has appreciated. So if we look at this example, the dollar... Um, for 2001, this is telling us that it costs us $3.67 to buy one euro. And then in 2002, it costs us more dollars now, 4.67, to buy one euro. So this is telling us that um, the dollar has gone down in value because it takes more to buy one euro. So that's going to give us B, the dollar has depreciated. 
one other way to look at this um opposites have to um if the dollar has depreciated that means the euro has also appreciated so for answers a and c these are the exact op or these are the same thing these are saying the same thing so the euro depreciating is the same as the dollar appreciating in this example and we can't choose two answers so that rules out a and c um, which would also lead us to b question 34 given the following set 3.1%, 5.3%, 4.3%, 12.1%, 4.2%, 12 12.8%, 12 and 1.8%. The third quartile is closest to. So we're going to be using our position formula again to get the spot where that number um, is, look, is located. Um, so we've got our, let me just pull this into, then we can do some highlighting. So we've got our N. Um, which we'll need to add these numbers up to get, or not add them up, but count. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers. So we can see that corresponds down here. Uh, and then our Y, since we're looking at third quartile, quartiles um, go 25, 50, and 75. So we're doing third quartile, 75 over 100. That gives us six. So since we know we're in position six, the last part we need to do for this problem is just put these numbers in order and then do our counting to get the one that's in the sixth position. Uh, so we put these in order and we can see that 12.1 is in our sixth position. Uh, so we'll go with answer B. Question 35, Turks Printers is a print, printer retailer that sells printers to large corporations the Turks use the FIFO method of inventory. Uh, and then we've got our inventory chart here showing us what they had at the beginning uh, and then what they purchased during the quarter. If Turks sells 130 printers to Hypercorp in April, the cost of goods sold is closest to. So we're using that FIFO method, which stands for first in, first out. So if we sell 130 printers, we're just going to go down the line here um, to uh, calculate our cost. So since our beginning inventory was 50 at 100 each, we're going to sell all 50 of those. And then we have 80 remaining, so we're going to sell or we're going to show cost of goods sold of 80 at 110 each. So we'll have 50 at 100 each, 80 at 110 each. Uh, We'll pull that in here and calculate that out, and we get 13,800, answer A. Question 36, which of the following statements is or are inaccurate? So our answers are gonna be some combination of these three statements, and we need to pick out which ones are wrong, basically. Okay, so first statement, Post-employment benefits and warranty expenses result in a deferred tax liability. Um, this is going to be inaccurate. Really, both pieces are inaccurate. So post-employment benefits, they can result in an asset or liability based on the fluctuation of the uh, market portfolio for, uh, for the contribution plan. Um, and then warranty expenses are also going to result in a, are only going to result in a deferred tax asset. Um, and that's due to your, it's not a true expense because you're basing it off of potential future losses of um, what can happen. So it, uh, that makes it a deferred tax asset. Uh, second statement, deferred tax liabilities provide future tax savings. That's also going to be inaccurate um, because deferred tax assets are going to provide future tax savings. If it's a liability, that means it's something that you're going to have to be paying in the future, um, not saving. And thirdly, if a deferred tax liability is not expected to reverse a valuation allowance is created. So this is, uh, if you put deferred tax asset in here, um, you evaluation allowance could be potentially created um, depending on that asset. So we're gonna say that all three of these are inaccurate and go with answer C. 
Question 37. Firm A reports under U.S. GAAP and firm B under IFRS. Both firms sell identical assets held for investment purposes for the same price of $2.5 million, assuming that the income tax on the sale of the investment is $275,000. Which firm is most likely to report lower cash flows from operating activities? So firm A will most likely report lower cash flows from operations. Firm B will most likely report lower cash flow from operations or they will have the same. Um, so under the key here is obviously that firm B is reporting under GAAP and or firm A is under GAAP and firm B is under IFRS. So under GAAP, this uh, tax expense um, is going to have to go under operating activities, which is going to lower that cash flow from operations. Whereas firm B under IFRS, the IFRS rules um, would allow that 275000 to go under cash flow from investing activities. Um, so in that case, they're going to have higher uh, cash flow from operations if they put under act, uh, investing activities than firm A would have. So our answer is going to be A. Firm A will most likely report lower cash flow from operations. Question 38. Baku Mart, a chain of hypermarkets, reported a net income of 400000 and paid cash dividends of 260000 to preferred stockholders for 2016. At the beginning of 2016, uh, Baku had 8,000 shares of common stock outstanding, but the firm issued 3,000 new shares on November 1st of 2016. Given this information, the basic EPS of Baku Mart is closest to. So we'll have our basic EPS formula here. Um, so we have our net income. Uh, which is going to be that 400k and then we're going to subtract out the preferred dividends um, which will give us the 260,000 um, so our top our numerator is going to be 100 or yeah 140,000 so then to calculate the weighted average shares of common stock we're going to need to take into account um, how many shares were at the beginning and then new shares that were issued throughout the year so basically, we're going to weight these um, as months. So we'll do 8,000 um, times 10 over 12 because we had 8,000 shares for 10 of the 12 months. And then we'll add the 3,000 shares um, just for those last two months. So let's pull that in here so we can see that. Um, so we've got our 8,000 times 12, like I said, plus 3,000 times 12 for those last couple months. Um, and then we'll divide that whole thing by 12 to get 8,500. So then from there, we've got all our numbers. So we're just going to plug it in. So we've got our net income 400, that preferred dividend 260, the 8,500 number um, for our 16.47 answer B. Question 39. MZJ and Sons, an audit firm, is reviewing the financial statements of XSpace, a space tech firm. XSpace has developed a communication device that will never require charging or batteries since the scope of the valuation of such a product is limited. This is going to be keywords here. Since the valuation of such a scope is limited, the auditors are unable to express their opinion. In such a situation, an auditor will most likely issue a A, disclaimer of opinion. Uh, this is going to be when an auditor doesn't have enough information or maybe they don't have the expertise to make an opinion on that valuation, uh, which sounds like is probably going to be our answer given that the scope um, of the product is limited and they're unable to express their opinion. But let's just uh, rule out B and C to make sure. So qualified, um, that's when the auditor concludes that the financial statements may not be an accurate presentation, uh, which is bad. It doesn't say anything about that in the question, so I think we can cross that one off um, as not going to be our answer. 
and then C, unqualified audit opinion. This is a good outcome when the auditor concludes that the financials are fairly presented. That also doesn't really uh, apply to the question being asked, so we can cross that one out too, and we'll go with answer A, disclaimer of opinion. Question 40. Core Corp has an inventory that was written down to $6,500. Due to a shortage in supply, the net realizable value of inventory increased to 8000 The value of write-up of inventory if CoreCorp reports under U.S. GAAP is closest to $0, $1,500, or $14,500. Um, key thing here is going to be U.S. GAAP. These write-ups of inventory... Um, you can write down inventory, but you can't write it back up under US GAAP. So our answer is going to be A, zero. If we were looking at IFRS, um, that would allow the inventory to be written back up. So you'd have answer B, but since we're doing GAAP, we're gonna have answer A, zero.